festival fraud, epic entitlement, and magazine time. Plus this day in history with balloon bombs over Oregon and our song of the day by Grizzly Bear. On your Morning Monarchy for May 5th, 2017, I'm James Evan Pilato of MediaMonarchy.com. Welcome to wherever you are for Friday's listener-supported blast of independent, non-commercial, alternative media. We are live every Monday through Friday at 9 a.m. Pacific time right here at MediaMonarchy.com slash listen. We are glad you're here. We are brought to you by you. And a huge thanks to our latest patrons. That's Kelvin I and Remy R. They went to Patreon.com slash MediaMonarchy and signed up to give us that little bit of support that we need each and every month. As I like to say, it keeps us going and growing, moving and grooving. And another huge thanks to Michael G. He gives us pretty consistent, generous donations via PayPal.me slash MediaMonarchy. And you can find the links to those as well as our snail mail address, our Bitcoin. Those are the ways to support us. MediaMonarchy.com slash support. If you can give a little, I can give a lot. A huge thanks to the Truth Seeker app for carrying the podcast of your morning monarchy and for RadioConfluence.com for not only rebroadcasting your Media Monarchy programs like The Morning Show, The Music Show, The Good News Show, The New World Next Week Show, but they also carry us live. They carry your Morning Monarchy live, and they carry your daily DJ set at noon live. Two live hours of radio each and every day, non-commercial, brought to you by you. And I think hopefully done in a fear-free fashion. Ah, It's a beautiful rainy morning here in Portland, finally. Those two 80-degree-plus days can go to hell. I'm not ready for that yet. Although, I may say... As soon as we wrap up our daily DJ set today, I might rearrange the entire studio. I realize the setting and everything isn't quite right, so I might spend the weekend doing that, and hopefully if everything goes well, we'll be back Monday morning on the air if I don't break everything. I went last night to see one of my favorite movies that I'd never seen in the theater. It was originally released in 1990, and I wasn't really seeing violent gangster epics at the age of 12 in the theater. Goodfellas was playing in a cool little movie theater we've got here in Portland called the Laurel Hearst Theater. Independent theater. They don't sell tickets on Fandango. You gotta go to the ticket, to the box office. It's the three screen place. They sell pizza, they sell beer, and it's kind of a second run joint. But they've always got one classic running. And actually, last night was the last night for Goodfellas, which is why I had to make sure I ran out there and caught it. Never seen it in the theater. They're actually gonna swap that out. And then all through May, they're doing Made in Oregon movies, so it's going to be Stand By Me, One Flare of the Cuckoo's Nest, Kindergarten Cop, Drugstore Cowboy. God damn, Goodfellas is so good. It's just such a master class in cinema. So exhilarating. Playing next door in the theater, though, I distinctly could hear the Echo and the Bunnymen killing Moon from the beginning of that new 15th anniversary redux of Donnie Darko, which I don't know if my psyche could actually handle that. So that's also play. So I might have probably have to play some... Could play Killing Moon on the pump up the volume, but I'll probably play Monkey Man from the Stones. So much Rolling Stones in Goodfellas. Had a nice, beautiful walk home with a very rare thunder and lightning storm here in the city. The one bad part, I couldn't help but notice so many houses, so many houses, all watching the Colbert Report, all filling their brains with garbage. We're trying to fill your brains with goodness, delicious, nutritious news that is brought to you by you. Friday is the entertainment industrial complex. We call it Media Memes. If you've got media stories, you can share with us using hashtag Media Memes. We love that on Twitter because we're not only crowdfunded, but we are crowdsourced. Each day of your morning monarchy focuses in on a different area, and you can find all those hashtags, all those things. It's all on the tweets. It's all on the website. If you can't figure all that out, if you don't want to be on the tweets, you don't want to mess with any of that, that's fine. Love to hear from you. James at MediaMonarchy.com. And, of course, we're on Skype and Wire as well, which I recommend, both as Media Monarchy. We have a lot of amazing synchrotastic news to go over on this Media Memes edition. It is Cinco de Mayo. 2017, again, I'm James Evan Pilato from MediaMonarchy.com, coming to you live from the Media Monarchy Studios up here in Portland, Oregon, and we are glad you're here. Let's glance at the breaking lamestream news. Hey, uh, kind of big news with Congress critters yesterday. Replacing and repealing Obamacare. We'll see what comes next for sick and ailing America. North Korea accuses the CIA and South Korea of plotting to assassinate Kim Jong-un. Again, as another example of art imitating life, imitating the interview. And I just saw this bad news out of my home state in West Virginia. 
We have breaking news out of West Virginia. Apparently a plane contracted by UPS, a cargo plane, went off the runway down a hillside at the Chuck Yeager Airport in Charleston, West Virginia. The Associated Press reporting the pilot and the co-pilot are dead, but no other reason given as to why this would happen. Apparently it took off at 5.43 a.m. Eastern Time, and there had been some bad weather moving through the area, but as to whether or not that had anything to do with this, we do not know. So difficult terrain to negotiate is what we are told by those at the airport through a spokesman, Mike Plant, there. Charleston, West Virginia, two dead there today. Mm. So now when you see... An airport in West Virginia. It's like, well, that could only be Jaeger. That's pretty much the airport in West Virginia. That's only about an hour away from my home. And if I'm going back to West Virginia, that's where you fly in and out of. Navy SEAL killed in action in Somalia. The first death there, at least spoken about, of the U.S. since 1993. Since, of course, Bill Clinton sent war troops into Somalia. And, of course, the French presidential selection becomes Trump v. Obama proxy war, as most phony selections are. Now, I'm glancing back at the chat, and again, we love it when you listen live, and you can take part in these shows. MediaMonarchy.com slash listen. Goodfellas, of course, you know, should have swept the Oscars. I think only Joe Pesci won, and did it maybe win screenplay? But I think Lorraine Bracco was up for supporting, and it was up for Best Picture. Did Ghost, did Ghost really win? Best picture for 1990 must have completely eliminated that from my mind. And the other thing there, sort of a sidebar, says Media Monarchy used to have the freakiest intro music with a spooky flute kind of jam, needle scratch, radio static, etc. He needs to bring that back. Now, I've thought about that before. I know we basically have an anti-show opening. It's all of, what is it? It's three seconds is my, is my show opening. This is very live and very fast. In a lot of ways, very different from the shows that we used to do. The shows we used to do essentially didn't really have a time limit. And they were hours long. And that intro was minutes long. But I also kind of feel like it was filled with a lot of the, you know, a lot of the Audis, holy shit, super freak out, martial law, we're all gonna die kind of thing. I feel like it's a very Infowarsy kind of thing, and I kind of feel like I don't want to bring that back. What I'd like to do is probably make a newer, better one that isn't so freaky and scary and isn't filled with fear, kind of like that one is. Now, if you want to hear what Rolando is talking about in the chat, you can, of course, roll back into the massive Media Monarchy archives. Hundreds of episodes, interviews, thousands of articles. So let's dive into our media memes news with art imitating life, and I think it's a pretty easy segue from yesterday's very dark Holy Hexes episode. A former science teacher in New Mexico manufactures meth. Sound familiar? The 3rd Judicial District Attorney's Office announced Tuesday that John W. Goss, who taught science at schools in Las Cruces and El Paso, pleaded guilty to charges that he manufactured and possessed methamphetamine. Ghost 56 of San Miguel pleaded guilty to two counts of trafficking meth by manufacturing and one count each of possession of a controlled substance and possession of drug paraphernalia. He entered the pleas in District Judge Fernando R. Marcias in 3rd Judicial Court in Las Cruces. Ghost was arrested back on October 2nd, 2016 during a traffic stop. During the stop, police officers discovered a white styrofoam ice chest that contained glassware, rubber tubing, and chemicals, which a lab later confirmed can be used to manufacture methamphetamine. Investigators subsequently tore his house apart and found additional chemicals and supplies that suggested he was manufacturing methamphetamine. Ghost's case somewhat mirrors the plot to the popular TV series Breaking Bad. In the AMC show, Albuquerque High School chemistry teacher Walter White, played by Brian Cranston, diagnosed with cancer and begins manufacturing and selling meth as a way to make money for his family. Walter White has become an icon of pop culture and the show has brought attention and tourism dollars to New Mexico. We talked about the guy getting nailed to the tree yesterday in New Mexico and the fact that we are probably going to have to move to New Mexico within the next year to be with family. I got an email this morning from a friend, Daniel, who basically said, dude, do not move to Albuquerque. Shit hole. Violent crime. Daniel, done and done, buddy. Cassie pretty much spent the very rough month of February when she was away dealing with family down in New Mexico. She pretty much spent that in a hospital in Albuquerque, and it was awful. She didn't like where she was. She didn't like the city. 
there were certain times where she, you know, of course you spend your day with your dad. You want to kind of go get a drink or something at night. And there are people saying, oh, no, wait, I'll, I'll walk you back to your hotel. We have zero intention of moving to Albuquerque, my friends. We're going to probably try and go someplace a little more like Santa Fe or Taos. Or, hell, we might be able to swing it and get up into Colorado. Fortunately, I left my commercial radio job and that I do media monarchy from home. And as long as I got internet and probably an air conditioner or two, we can continue to be independent, non-commercial alternative media brought to you by you, my friends. Again, I'm so glad you're here as we're diving into the media meme stories. Everybody talked about it, but it was basically happening last week as we were wrapping up our shows. And sometimes when there are these big, gigantic, shout of fraud of kind of stories that everybody piles onto, I kind of will stay away. However, I feel, though, it is important just for the record, as we have talked extensively over the last year plus on your Morning Monarchy shows about how all your concerts are belong to the powers that shouldn't be. So now, of course, the Fire Festival. The Schadenfreude event of the season develops into a $100 million class action lawsuit against the organizers after attendees of the Luxury Music Festival, who paid thousands of dollars to end up living in refugee tents, have claimed that the promoters intentionally deceived and defrauded them. The fallout continues after that disastrous music festival that stranded partiers in the Bahamas. Supermodels, including Bella Hadid, are facing serious backlash after they were paid to promote the event on social media. Bella is now apologizing to her fans. I initially trusted this would be an amazing and memorable experience for all of us, which is why I agreed to do one promotion, not knowing about the disaster that was to come, she says. Bella had a good laugh when photographers caught up with her in Manhattan. I was a fire festival. <laughs> Concert goers paid as much as $12,000 for luxurious accommodations at the music festival, but when they got to the fire festival, they found disaster relief tents and mattresses piled up in the dirt. Well, those are your mattresses. And as for gourmet food, social media posts shows it was nothing more than a cheese sandwich in a styrofoam box. In a statement, the organizer said, The team was overwhelmed. The airport was jam-packed. The buses couldn't handle the load, and the wind from rough weather took down half of the tents. Americans complained of being locked inside the airport terminal. Others reported being stuck on the tarmac for hours. We're going to have to deplane everybody. They locked us in the airport, like they with a chain. No water, no food. Stephen Fabian spoke to these kids after they finally landed in Miami. How bad was it? Yeah, it was a disaster. Absolute disaster. Oh, my. And these were not nice tents. These were like disaster relief tents. Yeah, and a storm had hit the night before, so the beds were soaking wet. The main festival was supposed to have kicked off on the Bahamian island of Great Exuma, which was advertised as a private island, but in reality is also home to a sandals resort. After the firestorm of complaints and headlines like Rich Kids of Instagram Meets the Hunger Games, the organizers canceled the festival. But a $100 million lawsuit has already been filed, calling the concert nothing more than a get-rich-quick scam from the very beginning. The Fire Festival organizers say all festival goers this year will be refunded in full. Also, all guests from this year will have free VIP passes to next year's festival. That provoked a big laugh on the Today Show. All ticket holders will receive a full refund and a VIP ticket to next year's Fire Festival. Next year. <laughs> if they decide to go. Really? Exactly. Next year. So there's your Fire Festival. Now I had actually had to ask the chat. I was like, what bands were even supposed to play that thing? Apparently Blink-182 is the one that everybody answered. And that is hilarious. It's kind of like the Woody Allen joke about the two ladies in the restaurant. I was like, ah, yeah, this restaurant sucks. This food is terrible. Yeah, I know. And the portions are so small. <laughs> yuppies gonna be yuppies. And as was noted, our buddy Embers of Liberty put it in last week. Someone said, I worked at Fire Festival. It was always going to be a disaster. And also reminding us about Woodstock 99. Actually, I had spent the summer of 99 with my brother up in Manhattan. He was by himself for that summer. His wife. Actually, were they even married yet? She was out of the country pretty much all summer. So we had... New York City brother time. Worked in a restaurant, commuted to work at 5 a.m. on the subway. It was like living in New York for a summer. Saw amazing movies. It was pretty rad. 
<laughs> but Woodstock 99 actually started the weekend I was heading back home, and it was somewhat like a Bill Hicks experience. I left New York, like, oh, Woodstock 99 kicks off, and by the time I got home, it was like, Woodstock in flames. Did I leave a cigarette burning or something? As expected, iHeartMedia has posted deep, deep, deep losses of $388 million on total sales at $1.34 billion for the quarter ending March 31st. That compares with a loss of $88 million on revenues of $1.36 billion for the year earlier quarter. While that shows revenue down 2.4%, the company actually posted an overall revenue increase of one6 but that was before foreign exchange impact. Most of the company's foreign exchange issues concerns its Clear Channel Outdoor Holdings subsidiary. You know, every billboard you've ever seen in America owned by Clear Channel? Almost every. The company's iHeartRadio division. Now remember, this is all this is all switcheroo. We've been tracking the mergers and acquisitions and murders and executions for quite some time. But the big news about its debt restructuring still up in the air. iHeart is offering a debt and equity swap to creditors, holding some $14 billion in debt. The company and its equity owners, Bain Capital and Thomas H. Lee Partners, have offered 49% of its publicly traded Clear Channel Outdoor Holdings, which currently has a market cap of $1.8 billion. And now, a moment of silence for Bain Capital. Okay, that's way more than enough. We will not shed any tears from massive media organizations who, again, are scrambling around to buy up everything because they know the game has changed. How about this as a scenario for a trashy late-night TV show? A connected private equity baron teams up with a scandal-hit media group to further roll up the industry after the regulator changes the rules of the game, allowing it all to happen. That may sound too contrived for the tube, no matter, it is playing out for real. On Sunday, the Financial Times reported that Blackstone was exploring a partnership with 21st Century Fox to acquire Tribune Media. Tribune Media owns 42 local television stations that affiliate with the national networks. It's been suggested that Sinclair, another local station group, would acquire it as part of a broader redrawing of the cable, satellite, and local television businesses. But all deal-making in the sector had until now contended with rules designed to limit concentration. Fox, like NBC, ABC, CBS, is a national network that owns several local stations in big markets. It's planned to combine its stations with Tribunes, with the private equity group helping fund the combination. The bid for Tribune would likely have to aggregate a value of $7 billion. Sinclair's Enterprises values just at $8 billion, making Blackstone and Fox compelling counterbidders. All right, we've got a bidding war for Tribune Media. It has a lot of big stations in some of the biggest and most lucrative markets in the country, uh, Chicago and Los Angeles, and on and on we go. Uh, but it's got the interest of, well, virtually anyone who is in the entertainment industry, including our parent company working closely with the Blackstone Group. Colin McShane has the very latest here. Hey, really interesting. The bidding war part of it, this is very interesting. You saw the pop in the uh, in the stock today. There are multiple reports of 21st Century Fox. The parent of Fox Business is looking to partner up uh, with Blackstone to make a bid for Tribune. Now, Tribune owns 42 uh, local television stations around the country, and a number of those stations are in big markets. New York, L.A., Chicago, the biggest three markets in the country, they're in all of those. It's 3.2 billion. That, give or take, is what the market values Tribune at uh, these days, but with the stock price rising, that uh, number has been going up. Now, Fox owns and operates 28 local TV stations around the country, but the Fox Broadcast Network is carried on far more than that, more than the 28, and some of those stations currently are owned by Tribune, so you see how that could work itself out. The other thing that's important or interesting about this deal is that last month the FCC changed some of their rules on TV station ownership, so it might make a deal like this, whoever ends up buying Tribune, easier to execute. And finally, to the point about a possible bidding war, the Wall Street Journal reporting that Sinclair Broadcasting Group and Nexstar Media both are in the running for Tribune as well as 21st Century Fox, and the deadline uh, for making these bids reportedly this Thursday, so we could see this come to a conclusion here by the end of the week, Neil. We'll see. All right, Connell, thank you very, very much. no business like stealing. The fireworks are possible because last month the new chairman of the FCC reinstated the UHF discount. We got it all on UHF. This allows stations that broadcast over the weaker UHF frequency to count less towards the concentration cap. 
The FCC also has limits on how much concentration a single owner can have, both nationally and in a single market, and those rules, too, may need to be rewritten for deals to occur. Synergies. Oh, God. So many terrible buzzwords. So the takeaway is that synergies in local broadcast M&A, that's murders and executions, are substantial. If Target charged lucrative fees, if Target's charge lucrative fees for providing content to cable groups, the buyer can charge those, too. Still... Core ad revenue is falling. Stations worry about digital entrants, such as Sling TV, and insist that obsolete rules had to be revised for the modern world. Like bad late-night TV shows, some plots are entirely predictable. You guys can keep merging as all, all, all you want. The tighter, what, you know, what's, what's that popular movie they say? <laughs> the tighter you grip your fist, the more galaxies will slip through your fingers. You are listening to The Morning Monarchy for Friday, May 5th, 2017, Cinco de Mayo. I'm James Evan Pilato from MediaMonarchy.com. The ultra-political filmmaker Oliver Stone has scored an interview. So many journalists have been seeking a sit-down with Putin. Actually, several sit-downs, most recently in February. Premium cable channel Showtime has secured the television rights to Stone's finished four-hour documentary called... The Putin Interviews. Showtime said Monday that the series will premiere Monday, June 12th. One hour will air each night of four nights, making phony liberals pee the bed. A promotional clip shows Stone asking, why did Russia hack the election? Putin is shown smirking at the question. Stone, who's been called the most controversial director in Hollywood, and CNN has a link to The Guardian, so it's got to be true. He's been a critic of American power and political affairs for decades. He recently told the Sydney Morning Herald that his Putin interviews will open up a whole viewpoint that we as Americans haven't heard. And he's probably right. Stone describes the four-hour series this way. It's not a documentary as much as a question-and-answer session. Mr. Putin is one of the most important leaders in the world, and insofar as the United States has declared him an enemy, a great enemy, I think it's very important we hear what he has to say. Stone's producing partner on the project is Fernando Sulichin. The two men have previously collaborated on films about other favorites like Hugo Chavez and Fidel Castro. Stone's most recent theatrical release was Snowden, a dramatic account of Edward Snowden's decision to leak information about NSA surveillance programs. Snow, or rather Stone, repeatedly met with Snowden in Russia while working on the movie. According to Showtime, Stone would Stone wound up interviewing Putin more than a dozen times over the course of two years, most recently in February, following America's next top president. Putin has granted a small number of interviews to Americans in recent years, including the Council on Foreign Relations' Charlie Rose and also the Council on Foreign Relations' Fareed Zakaria, noted here in this CNN article as being from CBS and CNN, respectively. <laughs> See, they don't give you the context. They don't give you the subtext. J.R.R. Tolkien and C.S. Lewis were close frenemies when they were both still alive and kicking, operating within the same old dusty Oxford literature circles and bantering over lofty subjects like theology, personal faith, and their own fantastical writing. But if there was one subject that truly brought them together, it was their shared hatred of Walt Disney. In private letters published in 2006, Tolkien companion and guide, and recently unearthed by Atlas Obscura, the fantasy legends sling bitchy insults and put-downs like stuffy academic gossip girls, decrying Disney's creative choices in 1937's Snow White and referring to the man himself as an ill-educated boob. Dwarfs ought to be ugly, of course, but not in that way, Lewis wrote in a correspondence to Tolkien shortly after they attended a screening of the film together. And the dwarfs' jazz party was pretty bad. I suppose it never occurred to the poor boob that you could give them any other kind of music. But all the terrifying bits were good, and the animals really most moving. And the use of shadows of dwarfs and vultures was real genius. What might not have come of it if this man had been educated or even brought up in a decent society? <laughs> Lewis also condemned the dwarfs, bloated, drunken, low comedy faces, and criticized the design of the evil queen as being unoriginal. So that's something Tolkien and C.S. Lewis and a lot of us could all agree on. Now, from one crazy to another, in an amended complaint, the ex-managers claim Johnny Depp 
wears an earpiece on set and pays someone to feed him lines so he doesn't have to memorize them. This coming from The Hollywood Reporter. Johnny Depp's former business managers aren't taking his recent comments about their dispute lightly, and they have escalated their claims against the actor in an amended complaint. Escalated. If you, as long as we're talking about buzzwords, if you run into that one, oh, I'm, I'm going to have to escalate this. The legal battle between Depp and the management groups, Joel and Robert Mandel, began in January when the actor sued his former business managers for fraud. TMG fired back, saying the actor's financial woes are all his own. TMG says Depp's sense of entitlement is clear and epic, as evidenced by his recent interview with the Wall Street Journal in which he said, it's my money. If I want to buy 15,000 cotton balls a day, it's my thing. Depp listened to no one, including TMG and his other advisors, and he demanded they fund a lifestyle that was extravagant and extreme, writes attorney Michael Kump in the amended complaint filed Monday. Ultimately, Depp and or his sister and personal manager... Elisa Christie Dombrowski knowingly approved all of Depp's expenditures. Cited among the purchases are 14 residences, 45 luxury vehicles, 70 collectible guitars, and enough Hollywood memorabilia to fill 12 storage facilities. Now that's the part actually of the story that's most interesting to me. I'd like to look at all that stuff. Notably, the managers also claim that Depp spends hundreds of thousands of dollars on a sound engineer who feeds him lines on set. That's pretty sad when you can't memorize your lines for a movie that you get a million takes on. I mean, it's one thing if they're feeding you lines from Little Cone in the theater. But yeah, I'd I'd be most interested in seeing what that nutball has as far as uh, Hollywood memorabilia. That's the fun stuff. That's the fun stuff to kind of archive through. And what a terrible, terrible downslide. It's always most disappointing when, you know, artists, performers, creators that seem to be kind of cool, seem to be kind of woke, slowly turn into nutballs. And we've speculated, of course, about the wild ideas of his possible handlers and Helena Bonham Carter and Tim Burton and just the terrible, terrible, terrible decisions they've made over the last 15 years. I haven't seen any of those movies in a long time. And as we've talked about in a lot of ways, even going to the movies last night, that's the first movie I've seen in a theater since probably last summer when I went to go see the 70 millimeter restored version of James Cameron's Aliens. We've talked about this a lot, you guys. We're pretty much sick of new movies. They're terrible, and I won't give them my money. But it's the classics that we love diving into. Really interesting article. Thanks to our friend Nicole Redu. The Lost Picture Show. Hollywood archivists can't outpace obsolescence. Studios invested heavily in magnetic tape storage for film archiving, but now struggle to keep up with the technology. This is a really interesting article that basically talks about how even all the movies made in 2000. None of the top grossing films in the year 2000 were recorded digitally. Now it's all digital, all the time. And they've invested so much in this magnetic tape storage thing. Little robots going around, beep boop boop, trying to check everything. I mean, there's so many even of the original, original, old films that we've lost. Burst into flames. In some ways, it's sort of like erasing history. Those who have that power have a lot of power. Robert Perry is warning. The New York Times is cheering on censorship algorithms. Just days after sporting First Amendment pins at the White House Correspondents' Dinner to celebrate freedom of the press. The mainstream U.S. media is back to celebrating a very different idea, how to use algorithms to purge the Internet of what is deemed fake news. The New York Times, one of the top promoters of this new Orwellian model for censorship, devoted two-thirds of a page in its Tuesday editions to a laudatory piece about high-tech entrepreneurs refining artificial intelligence that can hunt down and eradicate supposedly fake news. Since the Times is a member of the Google-funded First Draft Coalition, along with other mainstream outlets such as the Washington Post and the pro-NATO propaganda site Bellingcat, this idea of eliminating information that counters what the group asserts is true may seem quite appalling to the Times and its other insiders. After all, it might seem cool to have some high-tech tool that silences your critics automatically, but you don't need a huge amount of imagination to see how this combo of mainstream groupthink and AI could create... could... could create... An Orwellian future in which only one side of a story gets told and the other side simply disappears from view. 
And now they're begging for your money, begging for your support, begging for your subscriptions. And isn't that just what phony governments do? All the rest of our failed institutions, they repeatedly, repeatedly fail you. And then when it all blows up in hopefully their faces, but also sometimes ours as well, they all go, oh, if you just give us a little bit more money and power next time, we swear we won't mess up. Pinky swear, we promise. More on editing the past. Because forgetting the past solves everything, right? Netflix edits the Bill Nye Science Guy episode to completely remove a segment saying the wild controversial thing that chromosomes determine gender. Now you can watch that clip, you can watch the original version, and you can watch the Netflix version. It's basically older shows that had been around for a while, and Netflix is scooping them up. But in that scoop up, they entirely removed a pretty much two-minute segment. Not that we really care what Bill Nye is saying, but again, much like walking through Portland last night and noticing, Jesus, God, everybody's watching this Colbert crap. People lap up that garbage as well. Let's talk about some cool people we like instead. Roger Waters. The primary composer and lyricist of Pink Floyd during their most prominent years has, for decades, used his music to convey messages of peace and humanity. He has typically got it right, occasionally gets it wrong. One issue he's totally got right is the issue of Palestinian suffering at the hands of Israeli war, occupation, and economic blockade. For over ten years, Roger Waters has made the issue of Palestinian freedom a central point in his music and accompanying dramatic stage shows. Waters is part of the BDS, Boycott Divestment Sanctions Movement, which encourages individuals to boycott Israeli products and tourism. Waters uses his status as a music legend to highlight the plight of Palestinians. In 2012, he even spoke at the UN on the issue. He frequently pens open letters to fellow musicians, like Radiohead, asking them to refrain from performing in Israel until a meaningful peace settlement is released. This article from the Duran Roger Waters has lost millions by standing up for Palestine, but he doesn't care. Now, I did just see the announcement that the Roger Waters' Us and Them show is coming here to Portland just in several weeks. They, the show's in June. They just announced it. I'm going to try and weasel into that one. Another week, another batch of Sad obituaries. When Colonel Bruce Hampton slowly fell to his knees during the finale of his star-studded birthday concert, fans and musicians alike thought it was just another one of his quirky performance acts. 14-year-old guitar phenom Brandon Taz Niederauer tore into a blistering solo as the 70-year-old man lay motionless at his feet, his arm draped over a speaker. For several more minutes, dozens of musicians, including John Popper, the Blues Traveler, Warren Hayes of the Allman Brothers, John Bell, Widespread Panic, jammed away to one of Hampton's favorite songs, Turn On Your Love Light. The fans danced, and the musicians smiled as they waited for him to get up. But Colonel Bruce Hampton never did. The music community in Atlanta and beyond now mourning the sudden loss of a jam band legend. Colonel Bruce Hampton died on stage last night at the Fox Theater after a four hour long concert celebrating his 70th birthday. Matt Pearl talked today with those who knew Colonel uh, Hampton and and I'll I'll tell you what, I, I have to tell you, he is as much a part of Atlanta as anybody I can think of over the decades. I mean, this is one of those figures so indigenous to this area. His guest book has thousands of people. Yeah. I mean, Matt, everybody has a story about him. Mm. This was someone who was respected by his peers, adored by his fans. Colonel Bruce Hampton, the type of musician who could summon fans and fellow musicians from around the country to come to his home city of Atlanta last night for what would be his final show. An iconic building in Atlanta became Monday night the site of tragedy and Tuesday morning the site of tribute. It was just so much fun all the time. I always just kind of boogie a little bit harder when he's around. Fans of jam band legend Bruce Hampton knew him as Colonel Bruce. He started playing in Atlanta a half century ago, collaborated with numerous bands and projects, and influenced nearly every guitarist in his orbit. I mean, his spirit is never, ever going to leave this room. Six months back, Hampton reached out to a less iconic space, the newly formed Vista Room in Oak Grove. 
He asked if he could play every Thursday night. I'll never forget it. I'll never forget it. He just said, wow, I finally found the place that feels like home. In the jam band culture, the concert never ends early, and it runs on community. It's about coming into a place and forgetting about the outside world. You come in, you get lost in music, the fan meets the band. I mean, last night was just incredible. The night marked Colonel Bruce's 70th birthday. It brought musicians galore to the Fox for a four-hour tribute. We will not show how it ended, with Hampton collapsing on stage, confirmed dead later that night. But it's really sad, you know. Um, Yeah. We will tell you, those who loved this icon have tried to take solace in the company he kept in that final show. Surrounded by people you love, doing exactly what you love. It was very moving, and uh, what a way to go. I'm told Hampton most recently lived in Stone Mountain. Proceeds from Monday's show benefited the Fox Theater Institute and various musician-based charities. Well, there, there are so many people, Matt, that are sharing their fond memories of Colonel Bruce Hampton on social media. If you have something that you would like to share, you can join in on the conversation on the 11 Alive Facebook page. But uh, what a life he led around here. He, he touched so many people. That, that was sold out last night at the Fox Theater. And if you've seen the concert at all on YouTube, it was rocking. We were showing it live last night on our Facebook page. I, I found myself last night uh, around 9 o'clock watching it. It, it, was, it was amazing. It, it really was. And, and it's such a tragedy to lose him in, yeah. in, in that way last night. And, Extraordinary. And, but, you know, he, and he died doing what he loved, too, right? Yeah, like absolutely. So suddenly. Yeah, absolutely. Just Matt, shocking. Matt, excellent job. Thank you so much. Where did you get this? The alternative media, Jerry. That's where you hear the truth. You're listening to Media Monarchy with James Evan Pilato. You are listening to the Morning Monarchy, Cinco de Mayo 2017 edition. I am James Evan Pilato for MediaMonarchy.com. Colonel Bruce Hampton, RIP, and his aquarium rescue unit as well. This dying on stage thing seems to be a trend coming back this year. Sib Hashian, that we talked about from Boston, dying on stage at a rock cruise recently. And one more sad obituary. Granddaddy bassist and founding member Kevin Garcia died after suffering a massive stroke at the age of 41. Continuing on on your morning monarchy with other crimes against music, the Labyrinth soundtrack featuring five original David Bowie songs will get a vinyl reissue. It's been 31 years since the cult classic Labyrinth was released. But did you know there was only ever one vinyl release of the soundtrack? Well, Capitol Studios got with the times. Oh, the irony that Metro notes, of course, that vinyl sales have eclipsed download sales for the first time in music history. And again, it means two things. It means that people want real, tangible things that mean something and last. And two, it means the powers that shouldn't be have figured that out and are jacking up the rates and are happy to sell people $30 LPs. I'm just picking on Labyrinth. And his giant package, good lord. (laughs) In one of his first dealings as an advisor to the Prince Estate, Spotify executive Troy Carter is helping negotiate a deal that could give one major streaming service exclusive rights to one of the late pop star's unreleased concert films, as well as the rights to make a documentary about the film. The lucky streaming service isn't likely to be Carter's employee, Spotify, though. The estate is talking to a range of Spotify's rivals, including Apple Music. The potential multi-million dollar deal, which hasn't been completed, could be the latest prize in the competition among streaming companies, a battle that has been ratcheting up lately as top players shell out millions for exclusive content that can help them stand out from the pack. On the table is a film of Prince's August 3rd, 1983 performance in Minneapolis where he debuted several of the songs released on the soundtrack to Purple Rain, plus additional footage that a buyer could use to produce a documentary about the making of the film. The storied show at Minneapolis's First Avenue Nightclub was a surprise gig billed as a benefit for the Minnesota Dance Theater with a set list that included Let's Go Crazy and Purple Rain. That sounds pretty sweet. Prince Estate shopping new storied 1983 concert film and documentary to streaming services. And speaking of music, it is New Music Friday, of course. 
And there are brand new albums out today. It's no small album release day. And these are just the ones I could cram in of my favorites into a 140 character tweet. Slow Dive Return, Shoegaze Legend, Slow Dive Return with their first record in 22 years. At the Drive In Return with their first record in, what, 16 years? Oh, Motley, they never stop. They're awesome. They keep going. New music from them. New music from Portland's Moon Duo. They've got a pretty big sold-out show, album release show. It was either last night or tonight. New music from San Francisco. New music from Solly. And all kinds of other music that we might play for you on your daily DJ set at noon coming up a little bit later today. Now, before we get into a quick blast of magazine time, that is a look at my favorite disposable form of entertainment. I also want to do a quick note about book smarts. You know, we've been getting a lot more promo books and ebooks and things we try and incorporate into the show. And I came across one that's actually a young adult book. It doesn't come out until August 1st, but of course the title caught my name, caught my eye rather, Truthers. Basically sounds like it's the story about a daughter who listens to her dad who has crazy theories about 9-11. You are listening to The Morning Monarchy for Friday, May 5th, 2017. I'm James Evan Pilato from MediaMonarchy.com. Let's take a quick stroll through magazine time. My favorite look at disposable media. I'm a big fan of physical magazines. That's what we're just talking about, having physical things. I've got a near complete run of Spin Magazine. Mm. Not to mention, of course, Preacher and Invisibles and all kinds of comic book runs. Those are back at the East Coast Media Storage Bunker. But let's look real quick at first Record Collector, which is a kind of a newsprint magazine you can find in the lobby of pretty much any rad record store. And of course, you can also subscribe to it as well. And one of the two things I want to mention, they talk about Resistance Radio. The Man in the High Castle album is supposed to be super rad, and it's basically all packaged like it's, you know, propaganda. The cover story on the latest issue of Record Collector is about Robbie Robertson. Now, I don't know a hell of a lot about Robbie Robertson or the band or any of that stuff. Again, there's another Martin Scorsese connection. But the cover story is a large exclusive interview with Robbie Robertson, and he's got a new big memoir that he's just got out. One of the things that caught my eye as I was reading through it the other day, and I haven't completed the entire interview... Robbie Robertson said, I didn't think about it until I went there, but over the years to friends, I told them some of these stories, and when I told them the story, they'd be like, holy shit! So I'd be like, I guess that's interesting to somebody, like when I talk about the Jack Ruby experience in Dallas, Texas. It's like I told people about playing that Skyline Lounge Club before. Robbie Robertson, Jack Ruby, strange connections. Now, another magazine you're probably not going to be able to get your hands on is called Vortex. It is a Portland magazine. They're actually celebrating their third birthday tonight. They're doing a show at the Alberta Street Pub. And flipping through this, something caught my eye bigger than beer. What's bigger than that? There's a brewing company here called Gigantic, and they have a secret ingredient. They've been hooking up with record labels to produce really interesting things. They've been hooking up with Tape Op Magazine, Suicide Squeeze, Tender Loving Empire, And you can see these labels, gigantic, with axes of evil, the city never sleeps. And of course, there are other beer companies, like Ninkasi, they do Slayer for the holidays, and Made in the Shade, and actually Jerry Garcia's daughter does some of the artwork on this. I don't think you'll be able to get your hands on a copy of Vortex, but they are free also, again, in record store lobbies. I subscribe to Magnet Magazine. Now, they lost a bunch of subscribers, and they published a bunch of the letters because they, like everybody else, decided after eight years of not saying shit about Obama killing people, decided they wanted to get all political. And everybody basically said, you guys, too little, too late. I read this magazine for music. I don't want your bullshit political opinions. And I believe that. Seems like the biggest write-up in this new issue of Magnet Magazine with... Mike Watt interviewing Robert Pollard of Guided by Voices as the cover story. They always have a classics section where they go over a legendary album. And we talked about this a little bit the other day on Pump Up the Volume as we played the opening track from Interpol's Turn On the Bright Lights, turning 15 years old. And I gotta admit, that was one that I never dove into a lot. But that's, as we've noted, the fun thing and the exciting thing always about being a nonstop music fan is I know there's tons of music that maybe so far never really done much for me. But later, later you dive in, and later you go, oh my god, why didn't I get into this sooner? But you realize, hey, maybe I wasn't ready for it. So I wasn't ever really into Interpol, but something I was really into 
is Elliot Smith. The latest issue of Tape Op, which is the creative music recording magazine. I've said before, a lot of it goes over my head. It is for home studio recordings, and it's basically interviews with bands and engineers and producers. You can subscribe to Tape Op for free. For free, they'll send you Tape Op. It's made here in Oregon. It's run by Larry Crane. He runs Jackpot Studios, and he's been involved in a lot of Elliott Smith stuff. So one of the best write-ups in this latest issue of Tape Op is about the recording of Elliott Smith's Either Or. His 1997 record. That's when I got turned on to him. That's when I was still in college. But the thing that blows my mind reading this article, I knew Elliot Smith was from Portland. And I even knew that when I moved here, some of the songs made more sense. Oh my God, Alameda. I'm, I'm walking down Alameda. But it gets even crazier as I read this because they speak specifically and it talks to Sam Coombs of Quasi and all kinds of other artists and musicians who played with Elliot Smith around that time. And of course, he was in another band called Heat Miser making a record. I didn't know how close to where I live a lot of Elliot Smith's Either Or was made. The bulk of Either Or was recorded in our house on Northeast 16th Avenue, north of Fremont Street. Without giving too much away, that's goddamn close to where I live and run. I was thinking it yesterday when I was going for a run and running by. I was like, oh, if I go that way, somewhere over there is where they made Either Or. It's amazing to have those kind of real-world connections to art and communications that, that resonate with you. That's why I've always loved the sort of punk rock life. Our band could be your life. It's not some untouchable thing. And I've tried to make that a part of my work. And hopefully in some ways that, that all kind of resonates and all, that all makes sense. That's your Media Memes edition of your Morning Monarchy, my friends. All those headlines we put together in a Twitter moment and published those about an hour before showtime. So if you're listening live, you can follow the bouncing ball, as I like to say, and see all the stories that we're going to talk about. Let's do this day in history before we go out with brand new music. Holy moly, there's a ton of brand new music. You know, like you might be excited to hear that brand new LCD sound system song on our Pump Up the Volume coming up later today. But we will rock out at the end of this episode with brand new music, first new music in five years from Grizzly Bear. But first, this day in history, May 5th, 1862, Cinco de Mayo. Troops led by Ignacio Zaragoza halt a French invasion in the Battle of Puebla in Mexico. May 5th, 1886, the Bayview Massacre, a militia fires into a crowd of protesters in Milwaukee, killing seven. May 5th, 1891, the Music Hall in New York City, later known as Carnegie Hall, has its opening and first public performance with some conductor named Tchaikovsky. May 5th, 1900, the Billboard, later called Billboard, began weekly publication instead of monthly after six years of publication. Billboard's been around since 1894. Wow. May 5th, 1904, pitching against the Philadelphia Athletics at the Huntington Avenue grounds, Cy Young of the Boston Americans throws the first perfect game in the modern era of baseball. This day, 1905, the trial in the Stratton Brothers case begins in London, England. It marks the first time that fingerprint evidence is used to gain conviction for murder. 1912, Pravda begins publishing in St. Petersburg. 1920, authorities arrest those dirty Italians, Nikolai Sacco and Bartolomeo Vanzetti for alleged robbery and murder. 1925, serving an arrest warrant on John T. Scopes for teaching evolution in violation of the Butler Act. And on this day, May 5th, 1945, in Lakeview, Oregon, Mrs. Elsie Mitchell and five neighborhood children are killed when a Japanese fire balloon explodes near Bly, Oregon. They are the only Americans killed in the continental U.S. during the war. By mid-1944, Japan is getting hit on a daily basis from B-29 bombers. They are literally obliterating cities. Japan was dying. And Japan's only reaction to this is to strike back. Japan is faced with a serious problem. They can't develop a high-tech weapon. Our problem's in the brain inside of the Japanese head. There are 70 million of these in Japan. But perhaps a low-tech weapon, like a balloon, could be launched against America. 
A brain that thought in the modern way could be taught to use the latest modern weapons. They develop a technology that is absolutely brilliant, simple in its approach, but the technical ability of this bomb to be able to float to America and on its way be controlled by a series of sandbags that gets it to its target is incredible. Someone had to sit down and run the numbers to come up with exactly how many sandbags, exactly how far they could project the balloon to move. And I find that to be pretty incredible. That same brain today remains the problem, our problem. Over a thousand were launched. They went as far as Texas. And as long as they stayed airborne, they could carry great distances. So depending on the wind, and the altitude they maintained, they were falling all over Western America. In May of 1945, a minister, his wife, and five children from their parish were out on an outing near a town called Lakeview, Oregon. The minister was parking the car. He let his wife out and the children. They went into the forest. He heard her exclaim, look what we found. And seconds later, by the time he got up there, his wife, who was pregnant at the time and only 26 years old, and these five children were dead. It's tragic to think just how unlucky this family was. The only known deaths in the continental United States caused by the enemy during World War II. The wrong place, the wrong time, and the innocent curiosity that went horribly wrong. There are still balloons out there, obviously. Of the thousands they sent over, less than a thousand have been discovered. So you have to think that in the massive forests of the Pacific Northwest, Canada, Washington, Oregon, there are some balloons out there. If you're hiking in the Northwest, be a little careful. And if you see an element like a wheel with teeth on it, that's the sharp end of a disaster awaiting you. It can't explode. They're still there. They're still waiting to be found. Past is prologue, my friends. Let's continue to look at this day in history, May 5th, 1961, as Alan Shepard becomes the first American to travel into outer space on a suborbital flight. This day in 72, Paul Simon, Chicago, and Carol King perform at a benefit for George McGovern. 1973, Secretariat wins in the yet unbeaten record in the Kentucky Derby. And on this day in 1985, Bonzo goes to Bitburg. That's right, Reagan goes to a Nazi cemetery to, you know, pay his respects. On this day in 1987, Start of congressional televised hearings in the U.S. on the Iran-Contra affair. In 91, a riot breaks out in Mount Pleasant in D.C. after cops kill a Salvadoran man. And God, I remember this one. May 5th, 1994, American teenager Michael P. Fay is caned in Singapore for theft and vandalism. Published 10 years ago this weekend on MediaMonarchy.com, TSA loses hard drive with personal info. I'd buy that for a dollar. Approaching RoboCop world and... Bruce Willis says JFK killers still in power. Those articles published a decade ago to MediaMonarchy.com. Pretty amazing batch of birthdays for May 5th. Soren Kierkegaard, Karl Marx, Nellie Bly, Christopher Morley, Blind Willie McTell, James Beard, Tyrone Power, Leo Ryan. You might remember him as the congressman being killed in Guyana with Jim Jones. It's also Alice's birthday from the Brady Bunch and B. Davis, the late greats. It's also Ace Cannon, Delia Derbyshire, electronic pioneer that we talked about recently. It's also Lance Hendrickson's birthday, Tammy Wynette's birthday, Michael Palin's birthday, John Reese davies Kurt Loder, Bill Ward from Black Sabbath, Bobby Ellsworth from Overkill, Ian McCullough from Echo and the Bunnymen. There's another Echo and the Bunnymen sync. And it's also Adele and Chris Brown's birthday. We've got an all-new music episode of your Pump Up the Volume coming up at noon as we're going to wrap up your Morning Monarchy with brand new music from Grizzly Bear, Three Rings, the first sounds from those bands in five years. There you have it, my friends. That was pretty good. I like that one. Tell a friend about this one. Your Friday, May 5th, 2017 edition of your Morning Monarchy. And I hope you join us in a little while for your daily DJ set at noon, two live hours every day brought to you by you. I am James Evan Pilato from MediaMonarchy.com, thanking you so much for listening, my friends, and reminding you, as always, don't hate the media become the media. Take care.
You're listening to Media Monarchy with James Evan Filato. Since 2005, Media Monarchy has covered the real news about politics, health, technology and the occult, all remixed with music and media that matters. Go to MediaMonarchy.com slash support and become a monthly subscriber so you can help keep independent, non-commercial, alternative media going and growing. Thanks.